My name is Sarah Kate Merry, and uh, the quote in my title comes from Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, in which she laments the lack of female friendships depicted in fiction. Um, and the quote goes on to say, All the great women of fiction were seen only in relation to the other sex, and how small a part of a woman's life is that. So her work, among other things, was part of the inspiration for what has come to be known as the Bechdel-Wallace test, originally the Bechdel test. And I'm going to talk today about my analysis of a year of Ambridge Women's Conversations using the Bechdel-Wallace test as the basis of the analysis. And I would like to start by saying I have never said that the Archers is sexist. Um, <laughs> Uh, or I never compared it to a Bond film, either. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the Bechdel wallace test. I realise you won't be able to read this. I'll blow it up in a second. Um, but for any of you who, who don't know the details, Alison Bechdel is a cartoonist and a graphic, graphic novelist, and she wrote an incredibly long-running webcomic series called Dykes to Watch Out For. And in one strip, this strip, entitled The Rule, um, the character explains that she only sees a film if it uh, meets certain requirements. And these are the requirements. She sees a film if it has at least two women in it who have a conversation with each other and it is about something that isn't a man. This strip was written in 1985. It kind of it sort of disappeared because um, things weren't reposted as much then until in about 2005 when um, somebody picked it up it suddenly started appearing all over the place and people started talking about it as a way of um, they talked about it as the Bechdel test and using it as a way of evaluating the representation of women in film and in other media so it's often um, used um, as a measure of how feminist or how sexist a piece of media is I have lots of opinions about that. I don't really think that it works for it, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it later on. Um, I use Bechdel Wallace test, um, as I said there. Liz Wallace, who is credited in the comic, her name is, is up on the, the film marquee, um, she came up with the idea, and Alison Bechdel used it, so um, she, has asked, she has asked people, if possible, to use the Bechdel Wallace test. Um, she prefer, prefers the double barreled version. So, I took the test and adapted it very slightly um, for the archers. So I've used it very much as a base. And the basic criterion, criteria for a conversation to pass um, is that it must involve two or more women um, talking about something other than a man. And I gave it a time, a time criterion as well, so anything um, more than 30 seconds, which seems like a lot out of a 13-minute episode. But... Um, Actually, when I looked at the, the data, the vast majority of the conversations that didn't pass the 30-second rule um, actually didn't pass on other things. So they were mostly about men or um, a man joined the conversation. And my fourth criterion here is a man cannot be present even if silent. Um, obviously, if they're silent, I didn't know they were there. But... <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I was happily noting down the content of a woman's conversation and all of a sudden somebody piped up from the corner of the room. They are very sneaky. <laughs> so I kept those out. Um, also, if a man interrupted the conversation, so joined in, um, then I didn't, I didn't count that. So when I was testing the archers, um, I, pick, I had three different categories. When I did the chapter for the book, which was based on five months of data from February to June, um, I only looked at whole scenes, so I didn't um, really evaluate things that weren't an entire scene that was populated only by conversations that passed. But for this, I've looked at individual conversations because um, I thought it was quite an interesting thing, and I wanted to be a little bit less strict for this paper. Um, so a conversation passes if it meets the criteria I already mentioned. Um, a scene passes if it only contains conversations that are between women and that pass the criteria as far as time and topic are concerned. Um, according to my criteria, a scene could have a number of different conversations. Um, so people move in and out. So one example of that is that, for example, Susan and Clary could be having a conversation um, and Pat comes in and joins in. Um, 
And then maybe Tom enters the scene and makes it all about him. Um, so that could, that's, that's a scene that could have one or two conversations between women, depending on time and topic. Um, but the scene wouldn't pass because Tom comes in. And as far as episodes are concerned, I passed an episode if at least one scene within it passed my test. Um, this is going to be quite numbery, so if, if, if you find numbers traumatic, <coughs> brace yourself. And here's my first incredibly complicated chart, I will explain. <laughs> um, so I looked at a whole year, so I looked from the start of March 2018 to the end of February 2019, the 313 episodes. Um, in these episodes, there were 530 conversations between women. Um, and out of these, 267 passed the test. So I think that's pretty good, actually, um, considering all the stuff that's been going on in the last year and how um, focused a lot of the storylines have been on men, so Freddie, Ross, Brian. Um, there's been uh, Shula and Alistair's divorce as well. Um, a lot of stuff going on that involved men. So I think just a smidgen over 50% isn't bad at all. And then we're looking at the scenes. Um, the picture is a bit less rosy, um, 507 scenes over the year where women talked to each other, um, 196 of them passed, so just under 40% of scenes um, only contained conversations that passed the test. Um, this is what I looked at in my chapter, so I looked at only at scenes in my chapter, and for those five months it was a slightly lower percentage. Uh, this is a slightly lower percentage, so it might seem overly picky to expect a whole scene to pass the test, but um, the data does show that it is far more common for a man to come in and interrupt women's conversations than vice versa. This is how the episodes panned out. Um, of the 313 episodes, 109 of them passed the test, um, so that's 35%. Um, so at least those 109 had at least one scene made up of women's conversations that met the criteria. Of the 204 episodes that didn't, 96 had scenes that failed because the conversations between women were about men, or they were shorter than 30 seconds, which means that 35% of all of the episodes during that year did not contain any conversations between women at all. Um, when I did the analysis for the book chapter, it was more or less the same kind of percentage, and I found that the most surprising result out of everything. And I was hoping it would have changed slightly when we were looking at a whole year, but um, no, unfortunately not. Um, this is going to be my last graph, but I wanted to talk quickly about the amount of time that women's conversations take up. Um, the, uh, when I looked at the... This, these are the qualifying conversations. And out of the, the episodes that had qualifying conversations in them, um, more than about 40% um, of the total time of the episode, that's, a, that's the kind of average, that's the majority of the, of the time taken. So for, um, sorry, that makes sense. For the vast majority, women took, women's conversations took up less than 40% of the time, even if the episode passed. So it's quite a small amount, really. So I want to talk about the voices that we heard most often during the year. So I'm talking about not just the conversations that passed, but also the uh, conversations that didn't pass. So how often we heard women's voices talking to each other. So does anyone want to take a guess at who we heard most often over that year? <laughs> no, blimey, I thought everyone was <laughs> there. No. Okay, uh, they're all up it up there. But um, Elizabeth and Jenny oh. were top of the top of the table. Um, so, um, oh, word clouds. So obviously, the larger the text is, the uh, more often we heard the, the people. And this uh, shows the conversations that passed. So, in um, conversations that didn't pass, or the general, the total number of conversations between women, Elizabeth was way up there. She had about 135 conversations over the whole year with her and another woman, but out of them, only um, 52 passed the test. So obviously Elizabeth had a lot to talk about, but most of it was to do with Freddie and Russ. Um, Jennifer also 
had a lot to talk about. And again, she, was, she came just below Elizabeth in terms of the total number of conversations. Um, surprisingly, uh, she came a lot higher than her in, um, the, in terms of conversations that passed. And I think, although, she, well, she did spend a lot of time not talking to Brian, so I suppose that... <laughs> and being, being very angry with Brian. So um, a lot of her conversations were with um, Lillian and uh, Peggy. Um, close, sort of higher up, high up again, um, you mentioned Lillian and there's Pat is up there. Lily, obviously, she had a lot of conversations with um, Elizabeth. Pat and Helen, a lot of conversations. Um, and uh, Olwyn is up there. Uh, because although she was only around for a couple of months, she talked a lot and all of her conversations passed. Um, and most of her conversations were with Pat, so... Um, you know, so she bumped Pat's stats up a, a bit as well. Um, if anyone has really good eyesight, you might spot that underneath Alwyn's name on the bottom left is Bess. If anyone doesn't remember who Bess is, it's Ben's sheepdog. <laughs> I have to admit. I have to admit, I totally did this to entertain myself. But it's true. There was a 30-second conversation between Jill and Bess in the Brookville kitchen. <laughs> On the day that Jill poisoned her. <laughs> so having looked at the individuals, these are the people who talked most often to each other. There are um, a lot of conversations between three and four women as well, but these are the, the, top, the top counts were all um, between pairs. So these are, number, these are ordered by the conversations that pass, um, but you can see that they're, you know, there's quite high numbers um, of conversations. Uh, so, but the percentages of, you know, par of, of conversations against passing conversations are quite interesting, especially when you look at um, Elizabeth and Shula, who had 30 conversations, which is quite a high number, but only seven of them passed because they were, you know, almost all about Russ, Freddie, or Alistair. Um, Elizabeth and Lily, high up there. They did talk a lot about Freddie, obviously, but they also talked a lot about Lower Loxley and about Meredith. So, you know, Meredith and lesbianism are high up there on the topics of conversation. Um, Helen and Pat, of course, because uh, no one else seems to want to talk to them. Um, um, so out of the ten, these are the top ten, obviously. Out of the top ten, six of them are related, six pairs. And I actually thought that was quite a you know, low percentage for Ambridge. Um, the Owen and Pat um, sort of dyad is, was an intense flurry of conversations while Owen was there. Um, so she came in what, late March, early April, and she was gone by June. Um, but as I said, nearly all of her conversations passed. Again, Geraldine, I don't think I heard Geraldine until Elizabeth started to spiral downwards. And a lot of their conversations were, of course, regarding um, Halloween and all of the hoo-ha that happened around then. Um, Lily and Elinda, utter joy. I just, every time they spoke to each other, I, I was so happy. It was mostly about dogs, to be fair. Um, they have their ongoing love-hate relationship, obviously, but the dogs were, um, they brought out something extra in their relationship, I think. And of course, we have uh, Clary and Susan's uh, true relationship, which I think, Llamagate properly underlined for us all. Um, as far as conversations where every conversation that a pair or, or, or more of women um, had, if they all passed, there weren't that many um, that had a reasonable number. Over a year, um, the highest number was Alwyn and Pat. Every single one of their conversations passed. And Christine and Peggy as well. But uh, Christine and Peggy had five conversations and all of those passed. So these are the topics. This is the last thing I want to talk about. So the main topic of conversations, um, these are the top ten, but I want to... Um, geez, geez, obviously, Helen and Pat are high up there. Um, there's uh, Home Farm, obviously. I've kind of merged things in together. So Home Farm, the conversations were about the partnership, the meetings, um, and about the sale of the land initially and then of the house. So obviously that was the only thing Jennifer talked about, really. Um, Christine was a, a big topic of conversation. 
She kind of wasn't around much for the first six months or so, but then she had her fall, and then she was in hospital, and she didn't know where she was going for Christmas, and it was all the stuff. And I think it shows quite clearly how well regarded... Well, I'd like to think it shows how clearly how well regarded Christine is um, within the community. Or it might mean that she'll be dead by summer. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and of course affordable housing, up until the point when Emma wasn't allowed to talk about it anymore. That was high up the list and um, Canterbury Tales. So I made a, another word cloud, because who can resist a word cloud? Um, I don't know how visible that is from the back, um, but these are the top 25 or so. Um, Llama Gate is up there because, you know, I, it was uh, a big topic of conversation for Linda for a while. Um, and... Uh, you can see that um, cheese is high. The Pond of Poison, people did manage to talk about it without um, talking about Brian, which is quite impressive. And uh, dogs, obviously, very high up. Um, they come short, just after cheese, I think, um, because obviously Linda searched for the dog with the perfect rear view, using what Alwyn called Tinder for dogs. Uh, so that's it. That was a very whistle-stop tour through the results of my data analysis um, and my investigation into the conversations of the women of Ambridge. It was, um, I think it was an exploration rather than a desire to answer a question, but I think while it doesn't prove that the Archers is sexist, it does show that we just, we don't hear enough of the women of Ambridge, although your opinion on that might differ depending on which women we're hearing. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Any questions? No, <laughs> what's this? You had 108 episodes that no women were talking. Yep, no women talking to each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. How many about? How many episodes where no men talk to each other? I cannot... Well, I would say none, because I don't have any episodes that are 100% women, oh, apart from the Elizabeth therapy session. Um, but I didn't, I didn't um, count whether a, an episode was entirely made of men. So any episode where women didn't talk, I didn't really pay any attention to the other conversations. Um, so I think, I feel like that's something I want to go on to next. So I can't tell you the answer. I feel like my sense is that there are more conversations between women and men than by, between just, you know, I think there are probably more, com more episodes where there are conversations between women and men and men and men, but women don't talk to each other. I feel like there's probably not episodes which are entirely men talking, but I don't have the data to back it up. Hi. Hi. Your figures really helped me understand one of the reasons I've been dissatisfied with some of my listening, which is that there's less female friendship yes. going on in the Archers. And I think back to when Shula and Caroline were great friends. Yep. And I think about how Usha helped Ruth after her breast cancer and Kirsty with Helen. Yep. And also Carol's disappeared out of Jill's life. She's got new male interest, but Carol seems to have disappeared. I can't be absolutely certain off the top of my head. I think Carol had two conversations with Jill over the whole year. Yeah. Might be slightly wrong. We now hear they speak on the telephone, which is yeah. a bit odd when they're both in the village. Yeah. And this is my first time at this sort of event. And my wonderings are, how does this influence the script writers? If at all, do they come in cognito or... We can't, because we can't for me as a listener, the lack of female friendship has really detracted from my enjoyment of the art. <coughs> I would like that to be fed back to them through that camera, maybe. <laughs> that. That Kathy and that's, that that's, she's a real loss yeah. actually with all the stuff that happened mm. she just wasn't there mm. um, so yeah the, Kathy's silence has um, taken a, a significant friendship out of Ambridge mm. last question and then we have to move on one of the really interesting female conversations in the last few months was the um, Emma and Mia about menstruation yes, yes. 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 That felt different from anything we ever heard before, or I'd heard before, and I wondered just what your response was to that. I agree. Um, it was 
outside my analysis period, unfortunately. But um, sh yeah, I thought it, I did think that. I thought that it was definitely it had a different feel to it, um, and I don't know why. I don't know whether there's a new scriptwriter, scriptwriter, or um, or what. I don't know. I don't have an answer. But yes, I agree with you. I think I think that was noticeably different. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.